Let's start with the question, what is optics? Optics is all about light. It's a very broad field of study, and its development spans multiple millennia. Ancient Greeks already came up with the ray model. That's a part of optics. Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism shows that light is an electromagnetic wave. That's part of optics as well. Both are part of optics, but they're completely different. In one you draw rays, calculate their angles, and see where they intersect. The other involves solving a set of four vectorial partial differential equations. These two aspects of optics look very different, and have different applications. If you're going to design optical imaging systems such as cameras, microscopes or telescopes, you're usually going to think in terms of rays, and you don't really care much for solving Maxwell's equations. If, however, you're going to research metamaterials with unusual optical properties, then you'd probably care less about ray tracing, and you're more concerned with numerically solving Maxwell's equations to find out how light interacts with matter at the microscopic level. So in that sense, you could argue that these two aspects of optics are separate fields of study, each with their own applications. On the other hand, ultimately the ray model of light can be derived from Maxwell's equations. So in that sense, you cannot see them as completely distinct from each other. Indeed, sometimes it is necessary to use both models at the same time. For example, let's say you shine light on a sheet of glass. Some part of it gets reflected, some part of it gets transmitted. The transmission and reflection angle can be found using the ray model. Simply use Snell's law of refraction and the law of reflection. But to find the amount of light that is reflected and transmitted, one has to use the Fresnel equations. These are derived from Maxwell's equations by requiring that the tangential component of the electric field should be continuous at the interface. As a consequence, light with a different polarization has different transmission and reflection coefficients. So in this course, we are going to discuss optics. As we just saw, optics has many different aspects which can, in one sense, be considered as separate from each other, yet in another sense, they are closely interconnected. So how are we going to treat these different topics in a clear and coherent manner? Broadly speaking, we can distinguish three models of light, the ray model, the wave model, and the electromagnetic field model. Each of these models has its own practical applications, and each model explains certain physical properties of light. The ray model is used to describe reflection and refraction. It is used to understand how lenses can bend light and how that can be used to design imaging systems such as cameras, microscopes and telescopes. The wave model is used to explain interference. In the wave model we describe light as a wave as opposed to rays, but we don't care yet about different polarization states. Interference can be observed using a double slit experiment or when using diffraction gratings. A diffraction grating can separate different colors of light, which is useful for spectroscopy. Interference can also be used to measure small distances in a method called Michelson interferometry. Furthermore, the wave model of light explains why imaging systems have a resolution that is fundamentally limited by the diffraction limit. The electromagnetic wave model is the most complete classical model of light, it states that light consists of electromagnetic fields that obey Maxwell's equations. Because the fields are vectorial, it explains why light can have a certain polarization. It can be used to derive the reflection and transmission coefficients if light of a certain polarization strikes an interface, and it can be used to calculate the radiation pressure of light. These are the three models of light which can more or less be thought of as separate from each other. Nonetheless, at the same time, they are also closely interconnected. For example, in the ray model, the refraction and reflection of light is described using Snell's law and the law of reflection. The wave model explains why these laws are true. So we see that the wave model explains certain features of the ray model. Conversely, the ray model can be used to intuitively explain interference effects predicted by the wave model. If we want to understand the diffraction pattern of a double slit or a diffraction grating, we don't necessarily have to solve the entire wave equation. 
Instead, we interpret an optical field as a set of rays that accumulate a complex phase as they propagate. This complex phase determines whether different rays interfere constructively or destructively. Moreover, whether two fields can interfere with each other depends on their polarization states. For example, if two fields have orthogonal polarization states, they cannot interfere with each other. These rules are called the fresnel arago laws. So we see how polarization, which is due to the electromagnetic nature of light, affects the interference that is described by the wave model. We also saw that from the boundary conditions for the electromagnetic field, we can derive the reflection and transmission coefficients for light at an interface, which are given by the Fresnel equations. So in conclusion, we see that optics is a very broad field of study, which ranges from tracing rays to solving factorial partial differential equations. To treat these different aspects in a somewhat structured manner, we identify three different models of light, the ray model, the wave model, and the electromagnetic field model. Broadly speaking, these models explain different physical phenomena, and they have different practical applications. Yet at the same time they are closely interconnected, and sometimes they do overlap. We're going to discuss the ray model of light and its applications. The ray model is the simplest model of light, which was already known to the ancient Greeks. Let's start with the question, how do we know that light can be modeled as rays? One piece of evidence is the fact that we cannot see around corners. If we have an object, then we can see it when its rays of light reach our eyes. But if there's another object behind an obstruction, then we cannot see it if its light rays do not reach our eyes. Since we can only see objects via a straight line of sight, it implies that light consists of rays traveling in straight lines. Moreover, we can observe that in general, if we have an object, we can see it from all directions. This indicates that from each object point, there are rays of light traveling in all directions in straight lines. A very strong piece of evidence for this model of light is the camera obscura. It literally means dark chamber, and is nowadays better known as a pinhole camera. If we have a closed box with a pinhole on one end, and we put an object in front of the pinhole, then an inverted image of the object can be observed on the wall of the box. According to our model, each object point emits rays of light traveling in straight lines in all directions. But let's say the pinhole allows only one ray to enter. Now each object point illuminates exactly one point on the wall of the box. Because the object points are perfectly mapped onto the wall, we can see an image of the object onto the wall. This naturally leads to the definition of an image. An image is formed when rays coming from a single point end up in a single point. So if we have an object whose points emit rays of light in all directions, then the purpose of an imaging system is to make sure that all those rays end up in a single point again. If we don't want to block most of the light as we do in a pinhole camera, but rather want to capture most of the light, then we have to find a way to change the direction of the rays so that they converge again. Therefore we ask, how can we change the direction of light rays? There are two mechanisms by which we can do this, reflection and refraction. When light reflects from a surface, its angle of incidence with respect to the surface normal is equal to the angle of reflection. This is what happens with mirrors or water surfaces. When light refracts at an interface between two materials, the angle of refraction is given by Snell's law. Each material has its own refractive index that determines by how much the angle of the ray changes. This change of the ray angle explains why objects can look distorted if they're partially underwater. Now let's see how reflection and refraction can be used to design imaging systems. Let's first see how we can create an image using reflection. Consider an object point that scatters rays in all directions. We can reflect one ray using a mirror and determine its new direction using the law of reflection. We can reflect other rays with other mirrors so that all the reflected rays intersect in a single point. Because now all the rays coming from a single point end up in a single point, we have created an image of the object using mirrors. Now let's see how we can use refraction to create an imaging system.
Again, we consider an object point that scatters rays of light in all directions. If we put a glass wedge in the path of one ray, then we can use Snell's law to determine how it refracts at the interfaces. We can refract other rays with other glass wedges, so that all the refracted rays intersect in a single point. Because now all the rays coming from a single point end up in a single point, we have created an image of the object using refraction at glass interfaces. We have now explained how lenses and curved mirrors can form images. But an imaging system does not have to consist of just one optical component. Multiple elements can be combined to form a more sophisticated optical system. Let's say we have an object which we image with a lens. This image is called a real image. This image we can image again with a second lens to create a final image. The first image is called an intermediate image. Now let's consider a slightly different imaging system. Suppose we put the object so close to the lens that the rays don't converge to a single point anymore. No real image is formed in this case. But the rays are refracted in such a way that it is as if they came from another single point. This is called a virtual image. This virtual image can be turned to a real image using a second lens, for example the lens in your eye. The lens in your eye creates a real image of the object on your retina so that you can see the object. So the first lens didn't create a real image of the object, but it bent the rays in such a way so that to you it appears as if the object were somewhere else and had a different size. This is for example how a magnifying glass works. To analyze imaging systems quantitatively, we can use the ray transfer matrix method. To illustrate how it works, let's first consider a ray freely propagating through space. We define an optical axis, which is the axis around which all optical elements are centered. Let's say the ray starts at a height y1 from the optical axis and has an angle theta1 with respect to the optical axis. It propagates a distance d along the optical axis. We want to know the height and the angle of the ray after propagation. To simplify calculations, we make the paraxial approximation. This approximation assumes we only consider rays with small angles with respect to the optical axis. With this approximation, we can compute the new height and angle of the ray. These equations can be written using matrix notation, and the resulting ray transfer matrix describes free space propagation for a distance d. Now let's find the ray transfer matrix for transmission through a thin lens. If a horizontal ray enters the lens at height y1, it will exit at an angle such that it will intersect the focal point of the lens. The height of the ray is not changed by the lens. The angle of the ray is changed in such a way that an incoming horizontal ray will go through the back focal point and an incoming ray going through the focal point will exit horizontally. These equations can be written in matrix notation to find the ray transfer matrix for transmission through a thin lens. Now let's use these transfer matrices to analyze a single thin lens imaging system. We have a thin lens with focal length f. We put the object a distance SO before the lens. Using manual ray tracing, we can trace three rays to predict where the image will be. A horizontal ray will go through the back focal point. A ray going through the center of the lens will not be refracted. A ray going through the front focal point will exit the lens horizontally. The point where these three rays intersect gives the location of the image point. Let's call the distance from the lens to the image SI. Propagation from the object plane to the image plane can be described by the product of the ray transfer matrices. The product can be computed to find a single matrix describing the entire system. Now we can ask, can this matrix help us computing the image distance SI given a certain object distance and focal length? The condition for imaging is that all the rays coming from a single object point must end up in a single image point. That is, no matter at what angle theta1 a ray leaves a certain object point, it must end up at a fixed height y2. So y2 cannot depend on theta1. This means that the matrix element relating theta1 to y2 must be zero. Rewriting this equation yields the thin lens equation.
which relates the image distance to the object distance and focal length. The purpose of many optical instruments is to magnify things. Either we want to see small things like bugs, or we want to see large things like stars which look small because they are so far away. Therefore, it is important to be able to quantify the magnification of optical instruments. Let's suppose we have a small object, of which we create a real image using a single lens. This image can be projected on a screen or captured by a camera. If the object is 1 mm large, and the image is 10 mm large, then the object is magnified 10 times. The magnification is negative because the image is inverted. Generally speaking, the linear magnification is given by the height of the image divided by the height of the object, where the height of the image can be negative depending on its orientation. In the case of imaging with a single lens, we can see, using similar triangles, that the magnification is given by the negative of the image distance divided by the object distance. However, not all optical instruments aim to create a real image that can be captured by a camera or projected on a screen. Certain optical instruments, such as a magnifying glass, microscope, telescope or binoculars, are to be looked through. They don't create a real image, but a virtual image, which helps our eyes to see the object better. How do we quantify the magnification of such optical instruments? For that we need to define the angular size which is a measure of how large an object appears to us, as opposed to how large an object actually is. It takes into account that far away objects appear smaller due to perspective. Objects that are big, but far away, can have the same angular size as objects that are small, but nearby. The angular size of an object at a certain distance from the viewer is given by the angle it subtends. An optical instrument that makes the object appear larger introduces an angular magnification. Let's calculate the angular magnification that is introduced by a magnifying glass. First, we must know the angular size of the object if we don't use the magnifying glass. The angular size depends on how close the object is to our eyes. The closer the object, the larger its angular size. The closest that we can put the object to our eyes such that our eyes are still able to focus on it, is approximately 25 centimeters, and this is called the near point. Note that the value of 25 centimeters has purely biological origins. It represents the limitation of our eyes. It has no fundamental physical significance. If we use the paraxial or small angle approximation, the angular size of the object as seen with the unaided eye is given by the object size divided by the distance to the object. Now let's introduce a magnifying glass. A positive lens serves as a magnifying glass when the object is put at or just before the focal point. If the object is put at the focal point, a virtual image forms at infinity. The angular size of the virtual image is given in this case by the object height divided by the focal distance. The angular magnification of the magnifying glass is given by the magnified angular size divided by the angular size if we use the unaided eye. We find that the angular magnification is given by the near point distance divided by the focal length. At this point, it is useful to consider the difference between angular magnification and linear magnification. If we put the object at the focal point of the lens, the virtual image is formed at infinity, and it is infinitely large. The linear magnification, then, is infinite. But if we look through a magnifying glass, it would be absurd to say that the object looks infinitely large. The object does not look infinitely large, because the virtual image is also infinitely far away. So due to perspective, it appears finite. Angular magnification properly takes this effect into account, while linear magnification does not. Now let's look at the angular magnification introduced by a microscope. The simple microscope is basically a magnifying glass, called the eyepiece or ocular lens, except it doesn't magnify the object directly, 
but it magnifies the real image created by the objective lens. Recall that the angular size of an object, as seen with the unaided eye, is given by the object height divided by the near point distance of approximately 25 cm. Furthermore, recall that the linear magnification of a single lens is given by minus the image distance divided by the object distance. The size of the real image created by the objective lens is then given by this linear magnification times the object size. If this real image were to be viewed with the unaided eye, its angular size would be the image size divided by the near point distance. The angular size of the real image is the angular size of the object times the linear magnification of the objective lens. This real image is viewed through the eyepiece, which serves as a magnifying glass. We have already seen that a magnifying glass magnifies the angular size of the real image by the near point distance divided by the focal distance. If we plug in this expression for the angular size of the real image created by the objective lens, we find that the angular magnification introduced by the microscope is given by the linear magnification of the objective lens times the angular magnification of the eyepiece. Now let's look at the angular magnification introduced by a telescope. A telescope aims to magnify objects that are very far away. Each object point of a very far away object yields a bundle of parallel rays at the entrance lens of the telescope or the eye of the viewer. So if we have a telescope, then the light of the outermost object point comes in as a bundle of parallel rays, whose angle corresponds to the angular size of the object as seen with the unaided eye. An object at infinity will form a real image at the focal point of the objective lens. The size of this image is under the paraxial approximation given by minus the focal length times the angular size of the object. This real image is viewed through the eyepiece, which acts as a magnifying glass. The angular size of the real image, as seen through the eyepiece, is given by the objective lens image height divided by the focal length. The angular magnification of the telescope is therefore given by the ratio of the focal lengths of the objective lens and the eyepiece. Again we can point out the importance of angular magnification as opposed to linear magnification. If we were to project the virtual image created by the telescope as a real image onto a screen or a camera, that image would perhaps be several centimeters large. The actual object we're imaging, a star or a planet, can have a diameter of several hundred thousand kilometers. The linear magnification of the imaging system would then be close to zero, even though we do try to magnify what we see. The angular magnification, on the other hand, properly takes into account the fact that the large object we want to see looks very small because it's so far away. And although the actual image is much smaller than the actual object, it looks much larger because it's much closer. Previously, we saw that light can be modeled as rays, which travel in straight lines. Now we will see why and how light can be modeled as waves. One piece of evidence that light can be modeled as a wave is pinhole diffraction. If we send light through a small pinhole, the ray model predicts that the ray of light travels through the pinhole in a straight line. This is true if the hole is relatively large, but if the hole is smaller, then the light will diffract, which indicates that light is a wave. Another piece of evidence for the wave model of light is double slit interference. If you shine light through two slits, the ray model predicts you see the two slits projected onto the screen behind it. However, experimentally one would observe an interference pattern. This can be explained by modeling light as a wave. Furthermore, Snell's law, which we know from ray optics, can be explained if we assume that light is a wave. Let's say an incoming ray of light is described as a wave, whose wave fronts are perpendicular to the propagation direction. When the wave enters the second medium, we assume that the wavelength is reduced due to the refractive index. Because of the reduction in wavelength, the wave fronts are discontinuous along the interface, which is unphysical. To make them continuous again, we have to change the direction of the wavefront, which indicates a new direction of propagation.
Therefore, in the wave model, Snell's law is a consequence of a change in wavelength and the requirement that the field is continuous at the interface. Since light can be described as waves, let's look at the wave equation. And for simplicity, let's first consider the 1D wave equation. The 1D wave equation involves the spatial second derivative of the field, the temporal second derivative, and the speed of the wave, c. The general solution to this wave equation can be verified by substituting it into the wave equation. This expression says that if we have an arbitrary function f, then it propagates along the x-direction with velocity c. Similarly, an arbitrary function g would propagate in the opposite direction at the same time. In optics, we often consider monochromatic waves, that is, light with a single color or wavelength. A wave function with a single wavelength is given by a cosine. We can define the wave number k equals 2 pi over lambda to simplify the expression. If we substitute x with x minus ct to have it match the general solution of the wave equation, then we can expand the brackets and define the angular frequency omega equals kc. Just like k equals 2 pi divided by the wavelength, omega equals 2 pi divided by the oscillation period. We see that having a monochromatic field is the same as having a field with a single oscillation frequency, which is called a time harmonic field. In optics, it is common to use complex notation. A cosine can be written as the real part of a complex exponential. The reason why we want to do this is because this allows us to factorize out the time dependency. If we have a time harmonic field, each point oscillates in time with the same angular frequency omega. It would be redundant to keep specifying this for all points. The only interesting part is how the field varies in space. Complex notation allows us to factorize the spatial part and the temporal part of the field, after which we can ignore the temporal part. This point will become clearer when we consider the 3D wave equation, which is what we have to deal with in practice. In the 3D wave equation, the field depends on three spatial coordinates x, y, z, and the spatial second derivative becomes the Laplacian. Now we're going to assume a time harmonic field. Using complex notation, we can write the field as the product of a spatially varying part and a time-dependent part. If we plug this into the wave equation, we can calculate the time derivative and divide out the complex exponential. Using the relation between omega, k and c, we can simplify this expression to find the Helmholtz equation. The Helmholtz equation describes how a time harmonic field varies in space. The time dependence can be ignored thanks to complex notation. Now let's look at some solutions to the Helmholtz equation that play a special role in optics. One important class of solutions is plane waves. One can verify by substitution that a plane wave satisfies the Helmholtz equation. We can simplify the expression by introducing the wave vector k, whose direction indicates the direction of propagation and whose magnitude is determined by the wavelength. Another important solution to the Helmholtz equation is the spherical wave. More specifically, the spherical wave is a Green's function of the Helmholtz equation, which intuitively can be thought of as an impulse response. If we introduce a point source at the origin, then the solution of the Helmholtz equation is given by a spherical wave. In ray optics, we saw that a point source emits rays in all directions. In the wave model, a point source emits a spherical wave which propagates in all directions. In ray optics, an imaging system makes the diverging rays converge to a single point. In wave optics, the purpose of an imaging system is to transform a diverging spherical wave to a converging spherical wave. Now let's see how we can use the wave model to derive Snell's law quantitatively. We already saw that intuitively, Snell's law is a consequence of a changing wavelength and requiring continuity of the field at the interface. Let's introduce a coordinate system so that we can describe the plane waves before and after the interface. In general, a plane wave propagating in the xz plane is given by e to the power i kxx plus kzz. The specific values of kx and kz are determined by the direction of propagation and the wavelength of the light.
If the incident plane wave propagates at an angle theta i with respect to the surface normal and has wavelength lambda i, then kx is 2 pi over lambda i times sine theta i, and kz is 2 pi divided by lambda i times cosine theta i. One can verify that the length of the k vector is 2 pi divided by lambda i, as it should be. Similarly, one can write down the expression of the plane wave at the other side of the interface, where the propagation direction is theta r and the wavelength is lambda r. Let's say the interface is located at z equals 0. We require that the field is continuous at the interface, so we equate the fields at z equals 0. We can divide out the common factor of 2 by x, and then use the fact that the wavelength is determined by the refractive index of the medium. Eliminating the vacuum wavelength lambda 0 from both sides yields Snell's law, as we know it from ray optics. Now let's use the wave model to see what happens in some special cases, which cannot be fully described by the ray model. If a ray travels from glass to air, then light bends away from the surface normal. One can make the incident angle so large that the refracted ray will travel along the interface. This angle of incidence is called the critical angle. If the incident angle increases beyond the critical angle, the ray is internally reflected. Now let's see what happens if we describe this using the wave model. The wave model requires that the field is continuous along the interface so the kx components before and after the interface should be equal. At the critical angle, the refracted ray travels along the interface in the x-direction, so the kx component of the refracted field equals the length of its total k-vector. If the incident angle is increased further, the kx component will be larger than the total k-vector. How can one vector component be longer than a vector itself? If we write down the expression for the length of kz, we find that if kx is larger than k, then kz becomes imaginary. If we put an imaginary kz in the expression for the plane wave, we find that the field decays exponentially in the z-direction. This is called an evanescent wave. Now let's use the wave model to explain the double slit experiment. If the slits are sufficiently narrow, then each slit emits a spherical wave. If the screen is sufficiently far away, then the spherical wave can locally be approximated as a plane wave. The two slits then generate plane waves at different angles. Let's introduce a coordinate system and let's quantify the dimensions of the system so that we can compute the interference pattern. If the distance between the slits is much smaller than the distance to the screen, then we can make the small angle or paraxial approximation. If we assume the screen is located at z equals 0, then we can find the total field at the screen by adding the two plane waves together. But we don't measure the field itself. Instead, we measure the intensity, or brightness, of the field. Intensity is related to the energy of the field, so it is given by the squared modulus of the field. Moreover, brightness cannot have complex or negative values, so it makes sense to take the squared modulus. Writing out the product gives a constant term and two interference terms. The interference terms can be written as a cosine, and using the cosine double angle formula, we can write it as a squared cosine. This formula describes locally the interference pattern that is observed on the screen. So we've seen how we can use plane waves in complex notation to calculate the interference pattern. Now let's see how we can also use optical path length differences to calculate properties of the diffraction pattern. Let's consider an observation point x on the screen. We assume the screen is so far away that the rays from the two slits are approximately parallel, even though they eventually do overlap. Then the path length difference between the two rays is approximately given by d sine theta. In the paraxial approximation, sine theta is approximately equal to x over l. The two rays interfere constructively when their path length difference is an integer multiple of the wavelength. In that case, the peaks of the waves add up to create higher peaks, and the valleys of the waves add up to create deeper valleys. If, however, the path lengths differ by half a wavelength, we get destructive interference, because the peaks of one wave cancel with the valleys of the other wave. Using the expression we found for the path length difference, we can calculate for which observation points x 
there are maxima or minima in the interference pattern. Note that this result is in agreement with what we found using the plane wave approach. Previously, we saw how interference effects occur in a double-slit experiment. We assumed that two rays that are approximately parallel end up on the same observation point on the screen because the screen is very far away compared to the distance between the slits. In the wave model, each ray accumulates a complex phase as it travels. To find the phases of the rays at the observation point, we need to calculate the path length difference between the two rays. When this path length difference is an integer multiple of the wavelength, the fields interfere constructively. This leads to the double slit interference pattern, where the locations of the interference maxima can be calculated using path length differences. Now we're going to look at the fraction gratings, where instead of just two slits, we have many slits. Again, we assume that approximately parallel rays end up on the same observation point on the screen, because the screen is very far away compared to the distance between the slits. To find the locations of the interference maxima, we can again look at path length differences, and we find the same condition for constructive interference. This formula is known as the grating equation. So the double slit interference pattern and the diffraction grating interference pattern have interference maxima at the same locations. But the difference between the double slit interference pattern and the diffraction grating interference pattern is that the diffraction grating has sharper diffraction peaks. Before we analyze the diffraction pattern of diffraction gratings in more detail, let's first ask, why should we be interested in diffraction gratings? One reason why diffraction gratings are relevant is because they help us understand why the wave nature of light fundamentally limits the resolution of imaging systems. To image a diffraction grating, we need to capture its diffraction orders. But if the grating period becomes too small compared to the wavelength of the light, the diffraction angles can become so large that the imaging lens cannot capture them. This argument will be discussed in more detail in a later video. Another reason why diffraction gratings are interesting is because they are useful for spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is about separating different wavelengths, or colors, of light to study them separately. If we shine white light onto a diffraction grating, then the zeroth diffraction order will still be a bundle of white light. But in the first diffraction orders, the colors will have separated, because the diffraction angle depends on the wavelength of the light. In the measured far field pattern, the colors are separated, so that the spectrum of the input light can be studied. In the following, we will look at the diffraction pattern of a diffraction grating in more detail, and see how the choice of grating parameters affect our ability to perform spectroscopy accurately. We computed the diffraction pattern of a double slit by assuming that each slit locally generates a plane wave on a faraway screen. Adding plane waves of different angles gives an interference pattern. Similarly, we compute the interference pattern of a diffraction grating by adding plane waves of different angles together. The angle of this plane wave depends on the location of the slit. So let's write down the sum of all the plane waves from the slits. This sum can be calculated using the formula for a geometric series. We can pull out the same factor from the numerator and the denominator, so that we can write the numerator and denominator as the sine function. We can simplify the expression by defining the parameter gamma. So far we have assumed that each slit emits only a single plane wave, so the slit is infinitesimally thin but in practice, the slits have a finite width. To incorporate the effect of a finite slit width, let's first see what the effect is of shifting all slits by a distance s. If we add a fixed distance s to the slit positions, then we can simply pull out a fixed phase factor from the sum. Therefore, the diffracted field is multiplied by a phase factor that changes as a function of the observation point x. To compute the diffraction patterns of slits with a finite width b, we add up all the shifted slits together. We can straightforwardly calculate the integral over s and rewrite it as a sine function. We can simplify the expression by introducing the parameter beta. We now know the diffracted field. 
To compute the observed intensity, you take the squared modulus of the field. We have now obtained an expression for the diffraction pattern. Let's now understand intuitively what it looks like and how it depends on the grating parameters. If we plot the intensity as a function of the screen coordinates, then we can indicate the locations of the diffraction orders according to the grating equation. This is what the diffraction pattern would look like if we have an infinite number of slits with zero width. If we don't have an infinite number of slits, but only a finite number n, then the diffraction peaks will have a finite width. The maxima of these peaks occur when the denominator equals zero. Writing down the condition for the denominator to equal zero and plugging in the definition of gamma yields the grating equation, as we would expect. To find the width of a peak, we compute the first zero of the numerator. Writing down the condition for the numerator to equal zero and plugging in the definition of gamma yields an expression for the peak width. If the slits of the diffraction grating have a finite width b, the diffraction pattern will be modulated by an overall envelope function, which becomes narrower as the slits get broader. Now let's see how we can perform spectroscopy using this diffraction pattern. Let's say that for a certain wavelength, we have a diffraction pattern. For a slightly longer wavelength, the diffraction pattern is stretched out. Now we want to answer the following question. How well can we resolve the peaks from the two different wavelengths? We see that for higher diffraction orders m, the peaks are separated further, which makes them easier to resolve. Moreover, we know that if we increase the number of slits n, the peaks become narrower, which also makes them easier to resolve. Therefore, we expect that our ability to resolve peaks from different wavelengths is proportional to the diffraction order m and the number of slits n. To justify this expression more quantitatively, consider the expression for the width of a diffraction peak that we found previously. The position of a peak for a certain diffraction order and a certain wavelength is found from the grating equation. We can more or less say that we can resolve the peaks for different wavelengths when their separation is larger than their width. If the separation is equal to the width, the peaks are just barely resolvable. If we plug in the expressions for the peak position and the peak width, we find that the minimal change in wavelength delta lambda that we can resolve satisfies delta lambda over lambda equals 1 divided by mn. Defining the resolving power as lambda over delta lambda, we find that it is equal to mn. Now let's consider a spectrum that is broader and contains even longer wavelengths and shorter wavelengths. We see that a problem can arise. The longest wavelength peak from the first order can start to overlap with the shortest wavelength peak from the second order. Let's find out quantitatively when this overlap occurs. We know from the grating equation the position of the diffraction peak of a certain order and of a certain wavelength. We can equate the positions of the different wavelengths for the different diffraction orders. We find that given a certain shortest wavelength lambda min of the spectrum, the wavelength range over which there is no overlap between spectra is lambda min divided by the diffraction order m. This range is called the free spectral range. We saw previously how diffraction gratings can separate different colors of light through interference effects. We will now continue to investigate how interference can be used to perform accurate measurements. Interference can be used to measure small displacements. If two fields are in phase, they interfere constructively, so they give a high intensity. If one field is shifted by half a wavelength, the intensity vanishes due to destructive interference. The wavelength of visible light is around 500 nanometers. Therefore, by measuring the intensity of the total field, we can measure displacements of several hundreds of nanometers. Furthermore, we can use thin film interference to filter out wavelengths. If we shine light on a thin film, then part of the light gets reflected directly. Another part of the light first gets transmitted before it gets reflected. Due to the extra optical path length in the thin film, 
the two reflected fields have a phase difference, which depends on the thickness of the thin film and the wavelength of the light. Depending on the phase difference, the fields may interfere constructively or destructively. Therefore, the thin film can be used to filter out certain wavelengths, or the interference may be used to measure the thickness of the film. To see how interference can be used to measure small displacements, let's look at the Michelson interferometer. In a Michelson interferometer, we send in light through a beam splitter. Part of the light gets transmitted and then reflected onto the screen. The other part gets reflected into the other branch of the interferometer and then also gets reflected onto the screen where the two fields interfere. The length of one arm can be changed to introduce a path length difference. Because the light has to propagate to and from the mirror, changing the arm length by delta L results in a propagation distance difference that is twice as large. Now let's see what kinds of interference pattern we may observe on the screen. A parallel or collimated beam propagating in the z direction is described by e to the power i k z. We have it interfere with the second collimated beam with a path length difference of delta z. The intensity is given by the squared modulus, which contains an interference term that depends on delta z. So as we change the length of one arm of the interferometer, the intensity changes. When the path length difference has changed by one wavelength, the maximum intensity is observed again. Now let's see what happens if we tilt one of the beams. If we write down the two fields in complex notation, add them together and take the squared modulus to compute the intensity, we find an interference term that depends on x. So we see interference fringes due to the beam tilt. A larger tilt corresponds to narrower fringes. Changing the path length difference between the beams causes the fringes to shift. Now consider what happens if we have an extended source. In an extended source, each point emits rays in all directions. Let's consider a set of rays propagating at the same angle. We can write down the expression for this field in complex notation. The second arm of the Michelson interferometer produces the same field, but with an extra path length difference. Adding the fields together and taking the squared modulus yields an interference term that depends on the path length difference and the angle at which the fields propagate. Using the double angle rule, we can write this as a squared cosine and we can express the path length difference delta z in terms of the mirror displacement delta l. If the tilted field passes through a lens, it will yield a shifted focal spot with an intensity that depends on the mirror displacement delta l. Depending on whether a reflective surface in the interferometer introduces a pi phase shift, the expression for the intensity may contain an extra term. So far, we considered the focal spot due to a single plane wave at a certain angle. But an extended source emits light at multiple angles, and each angle yields a focal spot at a different position. All the angles together yield circular fringes, known as Heidinger fringes. As we change the mirror displacement delta L, the intensity changes more rapidly as a function of the radius r. In other words, the larger the path length difference, the more circles in the interference pattern. Now let's investigate thin film interference. If we shine light at a certain angle onto a thin film with thickness d and refractive index n, then part of it gets reflected at the top surface, while the other part gets reflected via the bottom surface. There is an optical path length difference between the two rays, which causes thin film interference. The optical path length difference is given by the refractive index n times a, the path length of the transmitted ray inside the thin film, minus the extra path length b of the reflected ray. The angles at which the two rays reflect are related by Snell's law. The length of a can be calculated straightforwardly using trigonometry. To calculate the length of b, we first define the length x. This length can be calculated straightforwardly, after which b can be calculated from x. We can use Snell's law to rewrite sine theta, and then we can combine all the results to find an expression for the total optical path length difference. Using the fact that tangent equals sine divided by cosine, we can rewrite the expression. 1 minus sine squared equals cosine squared, 
which allows us to find the final expression for the optical path length difference. Constructive interference occurs when the optical path length difference is an integer multiple of the wavelength. Destructive interference occurs when the optical path lengths differ by half a wavelength. The phase difference between the complex fields is found by multiplying the optical path length difference with the wave number 2 pi over lambda. Let's now see how we can also find this result by using plane waves and complex notation. An incident plane waves with angle theta can be written as a complex exponential. If we choose our coordinate system such that the top of the thin film lies at c equals 0, then we find that the field there equals e to the power ikx sine theta. This is also the field that is directly reflected by the top interface. The transmitted field will propagate to the bottom of the thin film, which is located at z equals minus d. Then it gets reflected, which means the z component of the wave vector will now become positive. This yields an expression for the reflected field, which has a positive z component of the wave vector and whose value at c equals minus d matches with what we found previously. If we evaluate this field at the top interface at c equals zero, we find that the phase shift with respect to the field that was reflected directly is the same as what we found previously. Having obtained the result for thin film interference, we can now look at the Fabry-Perot interferometer, which basically works by repeated thin film interference. We have an extended source of light with wavelength lambda. Each point emits a ray in multiple directions. Consider the light propagating at a single angle theta. Now we introduce the Fabry-Perot cavity, in which light can reflect back and forth. Let's say the proportion of light amplitude that is transmitted by the first interface is given by a transmission coefficient t. The proportion of light amplitude that is transmitted by the second interface is given by t prime. Similarly, the two interfaces also have reflection coefficients r prime and r. The light amplitude that is transmitted by the cavity after two internal reflections therefore contains a factor r r prime. However, when studying thin film interference, we saw that there is an additional phase shift, which we denote as delta. For each pair of internal reflections, the outgoing field is multiplied by r r prime and undergoes an extra phase shift delta. The total output field is given by the sum of these transmitted amplitudes. This sum can be calculated using the formula for a geometric series. Now let's make some simplifying assumptions, so that t equals t prime, r equals r prime, and we define capital T as t squared and capital R as r squared. To calculate the transmitted intensity, we take the squared modulus of the transmitted amplitude. The denominator can be expanded, and using a double angle identity, the cosine can be rewritten. The energy that is transmitted by an interface, and the energy that is reflected by an interface, should together add up to the total incident energy. Therefore, R and T should add up to 1. This relation can be used to eliminate t from the equation. We now have an expression for the transmitted intensity in terms of the reflectivity of the cavity and the phase shift introduced by the cavity. If we plot the transmitted intensity as a function of the phase shift, we see that there are transmission peaks when the denominator is minimal, so when sine squared delta over 2 is 0. The phase shift delta depends on the propagation angle theta and the wavelength. So if we focus the light with a lens, we see different wavelengths or colors of light focused at different rings. If the reflectivity is high, the peaks are sharp. If the reflectivity is lower, the peaks are less sharp. Just like in the case of the diffraction grating, we can ask, how well can we distinguish different wavelengths? To answer this question, let's first figure out the width of the transmission peaks in terms of the phase shift delta. Let's define the width of the peak at the level where the transmitted intensity is half the input intensity. We can introduce the parameter f to simplify the denominator, and we note that the transmitted intensity is half the input intensity when the denominator equals 2. This means that f sine squared delta over 2 should equal 1 
For a sufficiently narrow peak, we can approximate sine delta as delta, from which we find that the peak width is approximately 4 divided by square root f. We have now found the peak width in terms of phase, but what is the peak width in terms of wavelength? To answer this, we use the expression that relates the phase shift to the wavelength. We can express a change in the wave number k in terms of a change in wavelength. We can transform the peak width in terms of phase to a peak width in terms of wavelength. We can now find an expression for the resolvents. This expression can be further simplified. The peaks are located at phases which are an integer m times 2 pi. Using the expression for the phase shift, we can find an expression for the cavity width. Substituting this result in the expression for the resolvents and defining a quantity called the finesse of the cavity, we find that the resolvents for a certain diffraction order m is given by m times the finesse. Compare this result to the resolvents of a diffraction grating, which we found to be m times the number of slits. We have now found an expression for the resolvents of a fabry perot cavity. Another important quantity to quantify the performance of a spectroscopy device is the free spectral range. It specifies how large the spectrum of the input light is allowed to be before the spectra of different diffraction orders start to overlap. For the fabry perot cavity, the free spectral range is found by calculating the distance between two adjacent transmission peaks in terms of wavelength. We can straightforwardly calculate the distance between the two peaks in terms of phase. We can use the expression for the phase shift to find what different wavelengths these phases correspond to, assuming a fixed propagation angle theta. We can calculate the difference between these wavelengths and substitute the expression for the shortest wavelength to find that the free spectral range at a certain angle theta at the diffraction order m is given by the wavelength at that angle divided by m. In imaging optics, the diffraction limit puts a fundamental limitation on the resolution with which an object can be imaged. This limit is so important that its formula is worth remembering. The smallest feature that can be imaged has a size that is proportional to lambda over Na. Lambda stands for the wavelength of the light that is used and Na stands for the numerical aperture of the optical system. The precise definition of the numerical aperture will be explained later. If you're inspecting a sample using a microscope, this diffraction limit tells you the size of the smallest detail you can see. In the semiconductor industry, integrated circuits are printed using a method called photolithography. In photolithography, you shine light on a light-sensitive material to print a certain pattern. The diffraction limit tells you the size of the smallest feature you can print. To create smaller and smaller computer chips, we must therefore push down the diffraction limit further and further. The formula lambda over Na tells us how we can push down the diffraction limit to achieve higher resolution for inspection and printing. We can make lambda smaller, which means using shorter wavelengths. In the history of photolithography, we moved from the use of ultraviolet light to deep ultraviolet light and now to extreme ultraviolet light. Also, we can make the Na larger, which means using stronger lenses. Because the diffraction limit is so important in the development of computer chips, it's good to understand where it comes from. Let's first recall what it means to image an object. In geometric optics, each object point emits rays in all directions. An imaging system ensures that all the rays coming from a single object point end up in a single image point. In this model, there is no fundamental limit on the resolution with which you can image an object. In principle, it is possible to focus all the rays in a single point, which means you have perfect resolution. If we model light as waves, then each object point emits a spherical wave. The imaging system makes the field converge to a point spread function near the image point. Due to diffraction effects, 
This point spread function has a finite size, which puts a limit on the imaging resolution. So we see that in order to understand the resolution limit, we cannot just use the ray model of light. We must take into account the wave nature. Wave optics differs from ray optics by its ability to count for interference effects. It is the interference of light that explains why a diffraction grating has multiple diffraction orders. Therefore, it makes sense to analyze the diffraction limit with the help of diffraction gratings. So let's recall what we know about diffraction gratings. A grating consists of many slits which are separated by a period, which is also called the pitch P. We can illuminate the grating with a plane wave of light with a wavelength lambda. According to Huygens' principle from wave optics, each slit emits a spherical wave. This spherical wave can be interpreted as rays with a phase, propagating in different directions. If we consider two parallel rays from two adjacent slits, then they have a phase difference that depends on their path length difference. If this path length difference is an integer multiple of the wavelength, the rays interfere constructively. We now have found a formula for the diffraction angles, at which the different diffraction orders propagate. So if we illuminate the diffraction grating with a plane wave of a certain wavelength, then there is a zeroth diffraction order, which has the same direction as the incoming light. Higher diffraction orders propagate at higher diffraction angles. From the grating equation, we see that if we make the pitch smaller, then the diffraction angle has to become larger in order to maintain equality. So a grating with a smaller pitch has larger diffraction angles. We also see that if we increase the wavelength, the diffraction angles have to become larger in order to maintain equality. So illuminating the grating with a longer wavelength gives larger diffraction angles. Now let's suppose we have a very small grating that we want to image with a lens. The lens captures the diffraction orders that re-interfere in the image plane to give a magnified image of the grating. Let's for simplicity only consider the plus and minus first diffraction orders. When these orders re-interfere in the image plane, we get an interference pattern which is a low resolution image of the grating. Now let's make the lens smaller. The plus and minus first diffraction order are not captured by the lens anymore. So they don't re-interfere anymore in the image plane, so we don't see the grating anymore. In other words, the angles of the diffraction orders contain information about the pitch of the grating. So to see the grating, the imaging system must capture higher diffraction orders. If the imaging system doesn't capture any higher diffraction orders, all information about the grating pitch is lost. So let's find the condition for capturing the first diffraction orders. Let alpha be the largest angle that is captured by the lens. The sign of this angle is called the numerical aperture, or NA. The angle of the first diffraction order must be smaller than alpha, so the sign of the diffraction angle must be smaller than the sign of alpha. Using the grating equation and the definition of the NA, we find that the wavelength over pitch must be smaller than the NA of the lens. The pitch P of the grating is only resolved when the first diffraction order is captured by the lens. So features can only be resolved if they are larger than lambda over NA. This is the diffraction limit that we wanted to derive. Note that the NA of the lens is always smaller than 1. Therefore, we can state more generally that we can only resolve features that are larger than the wavelength of the light we are using. Let's look at what happens when we have features that are smaller than the wavelength. If we have a grating with a certain pitch, and we illuminate it with light of a certain wavelength, then there are diffraction orders with angles that are given by the grating equation. If we make the pitch smaller, the diffraction angle increases. If the pitch is as small as the wavelength, then the diffraction angle reaches 90 degrees, so they propagate parallel to the grating surface. What happens when we make the pitch even smaller? We have seen a similar situation in the case of internal reflection. If light propagates from glass to air, the transmitted ray refracts away from the surface normal. If we increase the incident angle more and more, we get to a point where the refracted ray propagates across the interface. The angle of incidence at which this happens is called the critical angle. 
If we increase the angle of incidence beyond the critical angle, we get total internal reflection. But more importantly in this case is that at the other side of the surface there is an evanescent wave that decays exponentially. Similarly, in the case of the diffraction grating, if the pitch is smaller than the wavelength, there are no propagating diffraction orders, but there is an exponentially decaying evanescent field. This evanescent field contains information about features smaller than the wavelength. Because the evanescent field decays so rapidly, normal imaging systems cannot capture the information of such small features, and therefore their resolution is diffraction limited. But there are special imaging systems that achieve super resolution by capturing the information in the evanescent field. One example is near field scanning optical microscopy. In this technique, a probe is put so close to the sample that it can illuminate the sample with an evanescent field and capture the reflected evanescent field. Another example is the use of an immersion lens. Suppose we have a sample with features smaller than the illumination wavelength. We can think of these features as a grating with a sub-wavelength pitch. If we illuminate this grating, it generates an evanescent field because the wavelength is larger than the pitch. But now suppose we immerse the sample in oil. The refractive index of oil reduces the wavelength of the light. If the wavelength is now smaller than the pitch of the grating, the light can propagate again. So the evanescent field containing the high resolution information is converted to a propagating field that can be captured by an imaging system. So to summarize, we wanted to understand why the resolution of an imaging system is diffraction limited by lambda over Na. We found that this limit can be understood by considering whether a lens can capture the first diffraction order of a diffraction grating. If the pitch of a grating is smaller than the wavelength, then no diffraction orders propagate, but there is an evanescent field that contains the high resolution information. Conventional imaging systems cannot capture this field, but super-resolution can be achieved by using special methods to capture the information in the evanescent field. In the following, we will discuss the Fourier transform and its relevance in optics. Basically, a Fourier transform allows you to write an arbitrary function as a sum of plane waves. This function can be one-dimensional, but it can also be higher dimensional, such as a two-dimensional image. This transformation is very useful in wave optics. Because light is a wave phenomenon, it makes sense to use a transformation that can decompose a field into plane waves and that can add plane waves together. But the applications of the Fourier transform reach much farther than just optics. It's also widely used in quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics is all about wave functions of particles. It is also used in parts of solid-state physics, such as crystallography. A crystal is characterized by its periodic lattice, and whenever periodicity plays a role, Fourier transforms tend to play a role, because plane waves are inherently related to periodicity. Fourier transforms are also very important in signal processing. If you want to filter out noise that has a certain frequency, the Fourier transform allows you to access that frequency and modify it. But for now we will limit ourselves to the applications within optics. To give an indication of how important the Fourier transform is in optics, one can simply point out that there is an entire field of study called Fourier optics. So let's see how the Fourier transform works mathematically. To understand how a Fourier transform can decompose a function into different wave components, let's recall how we can decompose a vector into different orthogonal components. To find the components of the vector v, we take the inner products with the basis vectors v. This gives the decomposition of v, provided that the basis vectors are orthonormal. That is, the inner product between different basis vectors should be zero and the inner product of a basis vector with itself should be 1. Now let's see how we can apply this line of reasoning to the decomposition of a continuous function into plane wave components. To find the component of a function g that corresponds to a wave with frequency fx, we take the inner product of g with the wave function, 
In the case of a continuous function, the inner product becomes an integral. The decomposition works because the waves are orthogonal to each other. That is, the inner product is zero for waves of different frequencies and non-zero for waves with the same frequency. To invert the decomposition of a vector, we have to add up all the components back together. Similarly, to invert the Fourier transform, we need to add up all the plane waves back together. We have now found the mathematical expressions for the forward and inverse Fourier transforms. Now let's see if we can intuitively understand what we can do with the Fourier transform. Let's say we have an image. We can take its Fourier transform to obtain a function of its spatial frequencies. Each point in the Fourier transform gives the complex amplitude of the plane wave corresponding to that point. Now suppose we remove all the higher spatial frequencies and only keep the lower spatial frequencies. If we then invert the Fourier transform, we find an image which has been blurred because it contains only slowly oscillating waves. If instead we throw away the low spatial frequencies and only keep the higher spatial frequencies, the resulting image only contains the edges of the features. This is because at the edges the function changes rapidly, and rapid changes are described by rapidly oscillating waves which correspond to the high spatial frequencies. Now let's see how the Fourier transform is relevant in optics. One important fact in scalar wave optics is that the far field of a near field is given by its Fourier transform. The near field can be considered as a collection of point sources. According to Huygens' principle, each point source emits a spherical wave. If the spherical wave propagates far enough, then locally it can be approximated as a plane wave. The angle of the plane wave depends on the position of the point source. Therefore, the far field is given by a sum of plane waves in different directions, which mathematically is described by the Fourier transform. Therefore, given a certain near field, we can calculate the far field by taking the Fourier transform. Another important result in Fourier optics is that the field in the back focal plane of an ideal thin lens is the Fourier transform of the field in the front focal plane. Each point source in the front focal plane of the lens generates rays that will be parallel after the lens. The direction in which the parallel rays go depends on the location of the point source. In wave optics, each point source emits a spherical wave that will become a plane wave after the lens. The sum of all the plane waves in different directions is given by the Fourier transform of the field in the front focal plane. Because the lens gives physical access to the Fourier transform of the field, we can apply physical Fourier filtering in an imaging system. The Fourier transform also plays an important role in understanding the ARRI disk, which determines the resolution of an imaging system. If we have an aperture, then its Fourier transform gives an ARRI disk. The larger the aperture is, the smaller the ARRI disk is. This is a general property of the Fourier transform, which in quantum mechanics is better known as the uncertainty relation. The broader the function is in one domain, the narrower it tends to be in the other domain. From this we see that if an imaging system has a larger aperture, the point spread function becomes smaller, so its resolution is higher. The formula for the resolution limit, lambda over Na, indicates the same relation. With larger apertures, we can see smaller features, which means the resolution is higher. Finally, let's see how we can use the Fourier transform to understand the far field of a diffraction grating. To do this, we must first understand the concept of convolutions. Suppose we have a system with some impulse response. Then we send some impulses through the system. For each impulse, the system outputs an impulse response. The total output of the system is given by the convolution of the impulses and the impulse response, and it can be written as an integral. By a change of variables, we see that the convolution of g with h is the same as the convolution of h with g. Now let's see what happens if we take the Fourier transform of a convolution. First we collect the integral over x. Then we apply a change of variables, x to x plus x prime. Then we separate the complex exponential. Finally, we separate the double integral into two single integrals. Each of these integrals is a Fourier transform, 
So we see that the convolution becomes a product after Fourier transform. Similarly, a product becomes a convolution after Fourier transform. This result implies, for example, that low-pass filtering an image is the same as convolving it with the point spread function. The smaller the low-pass filter is, the larger the PSF. Now let's use this result to understand the far field of a diffraction grating. A finite grating can be described as an infinitely large ideal grating, convolved with the grating period, multiplied by the total grating size. The far field is given by the Fourier transform. To find the Fourier transform, we Fourier transform each of the three functions individually, and then turn the convolution into a product and vice versa. From the uncertainty relation, we know that the broader a function is, the narrower its Fourier transform. To summarize, we've seen that the Fourier transform decomposes a function into plane waves. We found the mathematical expressions for the Fourier transform and its inverse. The Fourier transform has an uncertainty relation. Generally speaking, the broader a function is, the narrower its Fourier transform is. The Fourier transform plays an important role in optics, because the far field and the field in the back focal plane of an ideal thin lens can be found by using a Fourier transform. With the help of the convolution theorem, we can understand the far field of a finite diffraction grating. We have seen that to analyze imaging systems, light can be described using the ray model. However, in a double slit experiment, we observe interference fringes, which cannot be explained using the ray model. It can only be explained by modeling light as a wave. The curious thing is that only under certain circumstances you will observe the interference fringes. For example, if we shine laser light on the double slit, we see interference fringes. But if we shine ordinary sunlight on the same double slit, we probably don't see any fringes. This raises our first question. Why can some types of light interfere, but others cannot? We can make another observation related to interference. Oil slicks and soap bubbles look very colorful in sunlight. These colors are explained with thin film interference. But we just said that in the case of the double slit experiment, sunlight usually doesn't create interference. So why is it that the same type of light can create interference effects in one circumstance, but not in the other? In the following, we will answer these two questions. What we are trying to explain is the phenomenon of coherence. Coherence basically means the ability to interfere. Light with high coherence can interfere easily, and light with low coherence can only interfere under special circumstances. To understand coherence, let's look in more detail at the double slit experiment. The fields at the two slits propagate to a certain observation point where they add up. The path length difference determines how the fields interfere. Mathematically, the fields from the two slits at the observation point are given by two complex numbers E1, E2. After adding them together, you take the squared modulus to calculate the intensity. If you expand the product, it yields a term that depends on the phase difference between E1 and E2. For different observation points, you get other path length differences. This means you get another phase difference, which changes the value of the interference term. Therefore, in the intensity pattern, there will be interference fringes. Now let's see what happens if the phases of the fields at the two slits change over time. If the phase difference changes over time, then the interference pattern moves around. If the interference pattern moves so fast that we can only observe the time average, then the interference fringes blur out, so that we don't see any interference effects anymore. However, if the phases of the fields at the slits fluctuate in exactly the same way, that is, if they are perfectly correlated, then the phase difference remains constant in time, which means we can still see a clear interference pattern. If the phase fluctuations are somewhat correlated, but not perfectly, then the phase difference fluctuates only slightly in time. This means the interference pattern is somewhat blurred, but still visible. So generally speaking, there is a degree of coherence, which determines how visible the fringe pattern is. This degree of coherence is characterized by the parameter gamma, 
which is 0 in the case of full incoherence and 1 in the case of full coherence. So in summary, coherence is caused by random phase fluctuations in time and the fact that we can only observe time averaged intensities. The degree of coherence is determined by the correlation between phase fluctuations. High correlations correspond to a high degree of coherence and low correlations correspond to a low degree of coherence. Naturally then, the next question is, what determines the correlation between fluctuations at different points? The fluctuations in the field at a certain point are of course perfectly correlated with themselves. So if we consider two points which are very close to each other but are not exactly the same, you can still expect the correlation to be high. The farther you separate the two points, the lower the correlation between their fields is expected to be. So we can define a coherence width within which fields at different points are highly correlated and outside of which the correlation is low. With this knowledge, we can return to our two questions. Why is it that one type of light can generate an interference pattern in a double slit experiment, but another type of light cannot, in the same double slit experiment? It's because laser light has a larger coherence width than sunlight, and we can only see an interference pattern if the distance between the slits is smaller than the coherence width of the light. It also means that if you make the distance between the slits sufficiently small, sunlight can generate an interference pattern as well. The second question was, why can't you see interference effects when you see sunlight in a double slit experiment, while you can see interference effects in oil slicks or soap bubbles? The reason is that for very thin films, the distance between two points that have to interfere is very small, smaller than the coherence width of sunlight. But in a double slit experiment, the distance between the slits is typically larger than the coherence of light. So that's why sunlight can interfere in thin films, but not in a double slit experiment if the distance between the slits is too large. Now that we have answered our main two questions, let's dive a bit deeper into the details of coherence. A distinction is often made between spatial coherence and temporal coherence. Spatial coherence refers to the correlation between fields at two points separated in space. It can be measured using Young's double slit by looking at the fringe visibility as explained previously. Temporal coherence refers to the correlation between the fields at two different times. Because light propagates at a certain speed, this change in time can also be interpreted as a propagation distance. Temporal coherence can be measured using a Michelson interferometer, where an incoming beam is split in two and then the two beams are made to interfere with each other. By changing the length of one arm, you change the difference in propagation time of the two beams. The spatial coherence is typically related to the size of the source. If the source is a single point source, then the field fluctuations are perfectly correlated, because all the fluctuations come from a single point. If the source is larger, where the different points of the source are uncorrelated, then the correlation between the two slits becomes smaller. The temporal coherence is determined by the bandwidth, or in other words, how many different wavelengths the light consists of. When light consists of more wavelengths, the points have to be closer together in time in order to have high correlation. Points that are farther apart see fluctuations of different frequencies, so they are not correlated. So if we have more wavelengths, which means we have a broader bandwidth, then we have lower correlations, which means we have lower temporal coherence. Spatial coherence is for example used in stellar interferometry. By measuring the spatial coherence of starlight using a double slit like setup, we can infer the size of the star. Temporal coherence is used in applications such as optical coherence tomography and white light interferometry. In a Michelson interferometer, light with low temporal coherence can only interfere when path lengths are closely matched. So if you put a thick sample in one of the paths, you can select which plane interferes with the reference beam. Scanning the samples yields three-dimensional information. Coherence and incoherence also play an important role in imaging. In ray optics, an imaging system ensures that all the rays coming from a single object point converge at a single image point. In wave optics, each object point emits a spherical wave, and the imaging system makes the field converge in the corresponding image point. But because of the wave nature of light, the field cannot be perfectly focused in a single point, but rather it gives a spread out field called the point spread function, or PSF. In the case of coherent imaging, the PSFs add up coherently, 
so they can interfere with each other. In the case of incoherent imaging, the PSFs add up incoherently. So if we have an object point, it generates a PSF in the image. Other object points create more PSFs, which can add up coherently or incoherently. In the coherent image, there are more interference fringes, while in the incoherent image, there are fewer interference fringes. So to summarize, coherence is the ability of light to interfere. Coherence is the result of random field fluctuations and the fact that we can only observe time averaged intensities. The correlation between the fluctuations determines the degree of coherence. Light can be coherent, incoherent, or anything in between. We make the distinction between spatial coherence, which is determined by the source size and which can be measured with Young's double slit experiment, and temporal coherence, which is determined by the bandwidth and which can be measured using a Michelson interferometer. Coherence has practical applications in stellar interferometry, white light interferometry, and optical coherence tomography. Coherence also affects image quality. We have seen previously how light can be modeled as a wave. Our starting point was the three-dimensional scalar wave equation. Later, it was found out that light is an electromagnetic phenomenon which obeys Maxwell's equations. The electric field is a vector field, and from Maxwell's equations one can derive a vectorial wave equation for the electric field. That is, each component of the electric field vector obeys the scalar wave equation. Now we consider the plane wave solution, where all components travel as plane waves in the direction of the wave vector k. This solution for the electric field can be written as an amplitude vector a times the complex exponential describing the plane wave. Plugging this into one of Maxwell's equations leads to the constraint that the inner product of the wave vector and the amplitude vector equals zero. In other words, the field oscillates perpendicularly to the propagation direction. Let's assume the propagation direction is along the z-axis. Then the z-component of the electric field is zero. Therefore, a two-dimensional vector containing only the x and y components of the field is sufficient to describe the full electric field. This vector is called the Jones vector, and it is commonly used to describe polarization states. The Jones vector contains the complex amplitudes of the electric field components. To go from complex notation back to the time-dependent field description, we multiply the complex amplitudes with the complex time-dependent exponential, and then take the real part. This time-dependent description allows us to understand different polarization states. For example, the Jones vector 1, 0 describes horizontally polarized light. In this state, the electrical field oscillates back and forth horizontally. The Jones vector 0, 1 describes vertically polarized light, where the electric field oscillates back and forth vertically. The Jones vector 1, i corresponds to circularly polarized light, because if we write the field in time-dependent notation, we find that the x component oscillates as a cosine, while the y component oscillates as a sine. This means that the electric field vector rotates in circles in the xy plane, Generally speaking, the field vector moves in the shape of an ellipse in the xy plane. Lines and circles are special cases of an ellipse. Polarizers can be used to alter the polarization of light. If we have input light with a certain Jones vector, and we let it pass through a polarizer with a horizontal transmission axis, then only the x component of the Jones vector passes through. This transformation can be described using a matrix which is called the Jones matrix for a horizontal polarizer. Let's consider light that is linearly polarized at an angle theta with respect to the horizontal axis, and that has a certain amplitude, E0. The field transmitted by the horizontal polarizer only retains the X component of the input field. The intensity of a vectorial electric field is given by the squared length of the field vector we find that the input intensity is given by E0 squared and the output intensity is given by E0 squared times cosine squared theta.
Therefore, the input intensity is reduced by a factor of cosine squared theta, where theta denotes the angle between the polarization angle of the input field and the transmission axis of the polarizer. This is known as Malice's law. To see another way to alter polarization states, we must first be familiar with birefringence. In a birefringent material, light of different polarizations experience different refractive indices. Let's say we put a block of birefringent material onto a piece of paper. Each point emits rays in multiple directions. These rays get refracted when they exit the block. Because of the refraction, it appears as if the rays came from a different point. The component of the light that is polarized differently will get refracted differently, and therefore some part of the light seems to come from yet another different point. That is why you see two virtual images of the paper at different apparent depths. Birefringence is the mechanism by which wave plates can alter the polarization state of light. Suppose we have some input light with a certain Jones vector. We let it pass through a wave plate which has a thickness d and which has different refractive indices along the x direction and the y direction. Therefore, the x and y components of the field undergo different phase shifts as they travel through the wave plate. This transformation can be written using matrix notation. The polarization state only depends on the phase difference between the two field components. Therefore, we can pull out an overall phase vector from the Jones matrix, such that it only expresses the phase difference that is introduced by the wave plate. Depending on the thickness of the wave plate and the wavelength of the light, the wave plate can introduce different phase shifts. If the wave plate introduces a phase shift of pi over 2, so a quarter wavelength, then it's a quarter wave plate. If we send in diagonally polarized light through a quarter wave plate, the output will be circularly polarized. If the wave plate introduces a phase shift of pi, so half a wavelength, then it's a half wave plate. If we send in linearly polarized light, the direction of polarization will be mirrored along the y-axis. We've seen previously how scalar light fields can interfere, and how those interference effects can be used for measuring displacements or performing spectroscopy. But what we have ignored so far is that the way two light fields interfere also depends on the polarization of the two fields. This is described by the Fresnel-Arago laws. First, recall that the total intensity is given by the square length of the total electric field vector. If we add two fields with the same polarization, we see that they can interfere. If we add two fields with orthogonal polarizations, we see that they don't interfere, because there is no cross term between the two fields when we take the squared modulus to compute the total intensity. Unpolarized, but mutually coherent fields can interfere with each other as if they were parallel polarized. In unpolarized light, the x and y components of the electric field vector fluctuate in time with respect to each other so that no polarization state can be defined. The intensity we measure is the time averaged intensity, so that the fluctuations are averaged out. The time average is denoted by the angular brackets. However, if the two fields are coherent with each other, then the x and y components still add up coherently. If the fluctuations between the x and y components are arbitrary and uncorrelated, as they are for unpolarized light, then their time averages are equal. However, if the two fields are mutually incoherent, then they cannot interfere with each other, regardless of their polarization states. We have seen previously how Snell's law and the law of reflection describe the angles at which light refracts and reflects at an interface. Now we're going to see how much amplitude is transmitted and reflected when light strikes an interface. These reflection and transmission coefficients are given by the Fresnel equations. The first step to deriving these equations is to understand the continuity requirements for the electric and magnetic fields at the interface. Suppose we have an interface between two materials with different refractive indices. 
To find how the electric field behaves near the interface, we use Faraday's law. Applying Stokes' theorem, we find that the line integral of the electric field over a loop enclosing the interface equals the rate of change of the magnetic flux through the surface enclosed by the loop. This equation holds for any closed loop, so we can make the height of the loop so small that the surface integral goes to zero. In the loop integral, the integration over the vertical sides of the loop goes to zero. What remains is the integral over the sides along the interface, which should be zero. Because this should hold for any arbitrary choice of boundaries a and b, it means that the integrand must be zero for all x. This means that the tangential component of the electric field must be the same at both sides of the interface. To find a similar condition for the magnetic field, we use Ampere's law. By going through the same steps, we find that if there are no surface currents and the magnetic permeability is the same for both materials, the tangential component of the magnetic field must be continuous along the interface. So the tangential components of both the electric and magnetic field are continuous at the interface. The next piece of information we need to derive the Fresnel equations is the relation between the electric and magnetic field. Suppose the electric field is a time harmonic plane wave, propagating in a certain direction given by the wave vector k. To find the corresponding magnetic field, we use Faraday's law. Plugging in the expression for the electric field and integrating with respect to time gives the magnetic field. The wave vector k can be written as its magnitude times its unit vector k hat. We know that k over omega equals 1 over the speed c and we can substitute the expression for E. What this equation tells us is that the magnetic field is perpendicular to both the electric field and the propagation direction, and that its magnitude is N over C times the magnitude of the electric field. Now we're going to define different polarization states for light striking an interface. Depending on the polarization of the incident light, the reflection and transmission coefficients will change. One state of polarization is called S-polarization. In this state of polarization, the electric field points along the interface, so it's also called transverse electric or TE polarization. The other state of polarization is called P-polarization. In this state of polarization, the electric field vector is parallel to the plane of incidence, while the magnetic field points along the interface. Therefore, this state of polarization is also called transverse magnetic, or TM polarization. Now let's derive the transmission and reflection coefficients for these two states of polarization. First, we write the expressions for the unit vectors that indicate the direction of propagation for the incident, reflected and transmitted fields. For S-polarization, the incident, reflected and transmitted fields all point along the interface which in our case is the y direction. Now we're going to require that the tangential components, so the x and y components, must be continuous across the interface. The same must hold for the magnetic field. So we first compute the magnetic field from the electric field, and then we require that the tangential component of the magnetic field is continuous across the interface. These two equations yield the Fresnel coefficients for S-polarized light, now we can do the same for p-polarized light. We can write down the expressions for the incident, reflected and transmitted magnetic fields and require that the tangential component is continuous across the interface. Then we require the same for the electric field. So we calculate the electric field from the magnetic field and then require that the tangential components are continuous. Because we want the reflection and transmission coefficients in terms of the electric field, we relate the magnitude of the magnetic field to the magnitude of the electric field. By substituting this expression, we find the equations from which we can derive the Fresnel coefficients for p-polarized light. Now let's make a small remark about the reflection coefficients we found for S and p-polarized light. If the angle of incidence is zero, there should be no physical distinction between S and p-polarization, because both the electric and magnetic field point along the interface. But if we plug in theta i and theta t equals zero in the Fresnel equations, then the result we get for s-polarized light has the opposite sign compared to the result we get for p-polarized light. Why do we get different results 
if physically there should be no distinction between S and P polarized light? To answer that question, let's see what happens if we let the incident angle go to zero for P polarized light. As the angle goes to zero, we define the electric fields for the incident and reflected fields in opposite directions. However, in the case of S polarization, we define the electric fields in the same direction. It is a matter of convention whether we solve for this inconsistency or not by introducing a minus sign in one of the expressions. If we do include the extra minus sign, then the plot for the reflection coefficients, as a function of incident angle, for the transition from air to glass, looks as follows for the SMP polarizations. We see that for P polarization, there is an incident angle for which the reflection coefficient equals zero. This angle of incidence is called the Brewster angle. If unpolarized light strikes the interface at this angle, only S-polarized light is reflected, so the reflected light will be polarized. This is why, in photography and sunglasses, polarizing filters can be used to reduce the reflection from water or glass surfaces. Now let's find an expression for the Brewster angle. The Brewster angle is the angle at which the reflection coefficient for P polarized light is zero, so we set the numerator equal to zero. This expression contains both the incident angle and the transmission angle. To eliminate the transmission angle from this expression, we use Snell's law. We move the refractive indices to one side and then square both sides of the equation. Adding them together eliminates the transmission angle because sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Now we write 1 as sine squared plus cosine squared of the incident angle. Divide both sides by cosine squared and then write sine over cosine as tangent. We collect the square tangent terms on one side, rewrite the constant coefficients, divide out the constant coefficients and take the square root to find out that the Brewster angle is given by the inverse tangent of n2 over n1. There are several indications that light is able to exert pressure on matter, which is called radiation pressure. One piece of evidence is the fact that radiation can heat up objects. We know that on a microscopic level, if an object has a higher temperature, its molecules have higher kinetic energy. So radiation can increase the kinetic energy of particles. Moreover, Johannes Kepler already observed that the tails of comets tend to point away from the sun, as if radiation from the sun pushes the tail away. Radiation pressure has inspired the development of solar sails a type of spacecraft that is propelled by the radiation from the sun. Radiation pressure is also used in a method called optical tweezing, where focused laser light is used to keep particles in place. To see where radiation pressure comes from, let's start with the Lorentz force law. This law states how electric fields exert forces on electric charges, and how magnetic fields exert forces on charged currents. In this formulation of the Lorentz force law, we consider the charge's density and the current density, which leads to an expression for the force per unit volume. However, at the moment we're not interested in how electromagnetic fields exert forces on charges and currents, but rather we want to know how much energy and momentum is transported by electromagnetic radiation itself. To eliminate the charge's density and current density from the Lorentz force law, we use Gauss's law and Ampere's law. We plug these expressions into the Lorentz force law. Next we're going to rewrite the term containing the time derivative using the product rule. We use Faraday's law to rewrite the time derivative of the magnetic field. The resulting expression we can substitute back in the Lorentz force law. The resulting expression contains one term that has a time derivative. If the fields are static, this term will vanish. Also, if the fields are static, there is no radiation, because the radiating field is continuously oscillating. Therefore, we can associate the term containing the time derivative to the force density carried by radiation. We know that force equals the time derivative of momentum, 
Therefore, we conclude that epsilon times E cross B must be the momentum density carried by electromagnetic radiation. If we multiply this by the speed of light, we get a quantity that has units of force divided by area, which is pressure. If we multiply it by the speed of light once more, we get something with the units of energy per unit area per unit time, which is intensity. This vector, which points in the direction of propagation k if we consider a plane wave, is called the pointing vector. It describes the energy transport of electromagnetic radiation. So we know how the pointing vector is related to intensity and pressure. However, we must note that this expression for the pointing vector describes the instantaneous intensity. That is, it still takes into account the oscillations of the field at optical frequencies, which are typically too fast to ever observe directly. Therefore, the quantity that we will typically like to consider is the time average intensity, where we average out over all the rapid oscillations. Let's assume a time harmonic plane wave, with some angular frequency omega. E0 and B0 denote the amplitudes of the electric and magnetic fields. We know that the magnetic field amplitude is related to the electric field amplitude by a factor of c. To calculate the time average of cosine squared, we first observe that it must be the same as the time average of sine squared, since this is the same function except slightly shifted in time. The sum of these time averages must be 1, because cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1, and the time average of 1 equals 1. Therefore, the time average of cosine squared must equal 1 half. This leads to the final expression for the intensity carried by an electromagnetic plane wave. Now that we know the expression for the intensity, we can straightforwardly find the expression for the pressure by dividing by C. This is the pressure that radiation exerts on a fully absorbing surface. However, if the surface is fully reflecting, then the momentum that is transferred to the surface is twice as high in order to conserve total momentum.